Have you ever, like me, had an idea that you thought could change the world? I'm sure many of you have in this room. And have you then grasped that idea and looked for ways to implement it? Because if you have, you, like me, will know how painful that journey is. It's really painful, really difficult. And today, what I'd like to do is just look at the reason why we went through that journey and the main lessons that came out of it. And what we tried to do was put knowledge into the hands of patients across the world. And I'm going to tell you what happened and what some of the things we've learned from it. Um, let's start with a, uh, a reflection back on an experience I had recently. I went on a shoot with one of our film crews to a gentleman called Ken. Uh, Ken's about 80, lives in a flat in Torquay. And like many people in Torquay, he's a widower. Uh, his children live up country. Um, and we went to see him, and what was interesting on the way in, as we walked through his door, is it was obviously had two computer screens open. And as I walked past with the camera crew, I noticed that um, Ken seemed to have, I thought, a race card open on one of the screens. I couldn't see what was on the other, graphs and the like. Anyway, we shot his film, which was about his participation in clinical trials. And uh, during the journey of filming him, we had a conversation about life, what goes on, family, children, all the rest, as we normally do. And I couldn't help but ask him about the two screens that were open. And he explained, well, actually, I love the horses. I bet daily, without fail, I'll always go and have a, a, a go on the, on the horses. But he also said, my second screen is for day trading the dollar. So Ken buys and sells dollars uh, within the same day, 24-hour cycle. Now, you could argue that marks him out as unusual, but maybe not so. So I said, well, why? I said, well, you're a trader in an earlier life. Ken said, no, he said, I was a teacher. But when my wife died, I wanted something to do. I wanted something to stimulate my mind. So I taught myself online. Isn't that quite natural, really? Now, I'm not saying across Torbay there are scores of silver surfers um, day trading the dollar or any other currency. <laughs> I wouldn't promise you that. But what I am saying is that the internet is much more pervasive in the lives of the broader population than we necessarily think. Ken uses the internet for all sorts of things. Connecting with his grandchildren, sharing photographs back and forward, looking up the price of horses and obviously trading the dollar. Um, and there are many people like him across the world. And actually, you might think, well, he's 80, maybe he's unusual. Um, and if I told you that 16% of the over 65 shop online, you may go, yeah, that's fair enough. In 2008, 16% of the over 65 shopped online. It's now in excess of 50%. So 50% of that population out there will be shopping online and regularly. And it's not just the shift to the internet that we've seen. It's actually a shift in the way we engage with the internet. 11 million, two-thirds of 55 to 75-year-olds own a smartphone. 95% of those, and I might as well say all of them actually, will have used it to connect with the internet in the last 24 hours. John Lewis in their report that's just come out this last week um, reported that the smartphone is there now, their number one way that people are shopping, over and above computers on a desk. Do you remember those things? Um, and they notice as well that the heaviest usage they get is in store of smartphones. So hold that thought if you would. Ken himself has a smartphone. Ken, it won't surprise you, uses it all the time. But the shift is bigger than this. 40 million of us have a smartphone. 87% of the population have a smartphone. Over 50% of us will have watched video on that smartphone in the last week. Trini, good morning fashion section, uh, family videos on WhatsApp, the... Oh, the Marks and Spencer's preview of the Christmas video. And that's just my wife in the last 24 hours. <laughs> right. We used to um, have maps. Do you remember those? We've kept them on the back. So I saw one. I was up on the moor the other week, and there was a map on the back of somebody's car. And I thought, that's incredible. Surely not. Nobody uses them. Ken doesn't use a map. He uses the navigator on his phone. Whether Ken should be driving is for another day. Um, <laughs> So, what I'm saying is there is a lot of internet usage out there and a hell of a lot of on a smartphone in people's hands. And we started to build on that concept. But let's go broader still before I talk about my story. Why is that shift important? And I think there's a really important lesson here for entrepreneurs and innovators everywhere. 
whether they are in big business or small business, standalone, or just sat in their back room like many of us are when we start. What's happened is, somehow, somebody has put a device in the population's hands that is everywhere. It's in use all the time. And we, as entrepreneurs and innovators, don't need to distribute it. We don't need to create a protocol. It exists. It's in everybody's hands already. We don't have to distribute devices for people to use. I've never known a device in my history, my time, that has both the ubiquity and the capability of the smartphone. Ubiquity, yes. Vacuum cleaners, electricity, water, television, fridges, uh, whatever. But with that capability, we've never seen it before. So that is in the hands of everybody. And I would suggest that for us as entrepreneurs, as innovators, as strategic thinkers, our starting point on anything we are doing and innovating should somehow start with the mobile phone and work out. Not see the mobile phone as the end point, it's the starting point in the world in which we live. So the world has changed fundamentally. So just take that as a first thought, if you would, for me. So let's go back at Ken and think about another part of his life. Five years ago, Ken had a heart attack. Uh, he's also got diabetes, and his life was saved by the NHS. He values both the NHS and the treatment he gets, the drugs he receives, they keep him alive and active. He tries to keep active, uh, swimming, a bit of walking, um, he tries to do what he can to keep well and listen to his doctors. He cares, actually, like many of us do, both about the NHS and our own well-being. And that's why we were filming Ken. He wanted to give a bit back. He knew that he'd benefited from clinical trials, from people that had done a trial beforehand. He knew he'd benefited from that, and he wanted to encourage others to participate in trials in the future. So he's almost handing it on. Good on Ken. But Ken knows as well that our health system is struggling to cope. It's being squeezed in all directions. Not only is it the elderly with multiple illnesses, who, who would have died years ago, but it's children with allergies at the other extreme. Uh, before the 1990s, there was hardly any data on peanut allergy and its uh, effects. But between 92 and 2012, there was an over 600% rise, six times rise, in the number of admissions to hospital for anaphylaxis. The scale of the NHS is enormous. As we stand here, sit here, there are 142,000 people in beds countrywide who at some point, hopefully shortly, will be discharged. Five million of us saw a GP this week. 23 million of us will go to A&E in this coming year, and over 10 million of us will have an operation. This thing is enormous. And every one of those people and their families and their carers are looking for information about their well-being and their health. Not complex stuff, simple stuff. For Ken, how do I live with heart failure? How do I do my daily foot check? Because I've got diabetes. I want to make sure I not lose the sensitivity in my toes. For children, how do I use in my inhaler? For parents, what do I do if one of my children has an uh, anaphylaxis attack? How do I prepare for my operation? And what happens, what happens in the health service today is that you get given a leaflet, you get given a letter, text-heavy thing, you get a text-heavy web page, you, actually maybe you get shown what to do. Some registrar in a, consult in a consulting booth somewhere in a, in a hospital uh, down the way. I once watched a, a lady in a fracture clinic, she'd broken her wrist, and uh, the nurse, having re uh, recast her, was showing her how to do exercises that will help her recovery. And it's a very simple exercise like that, really, and you keep doing it for a certain number of times a day. And she sat there and she watched him, and she said at the end, she said, do you always wear that colour tunic? He was wearing a bright purple tunic, you see. And this nurse said, yeah, you've been in three times, and every time I've worn this colour tunic. This dear old lady couldn't remember the colour of his tunic, what are the chances of her remembering how to do this and at the right frequency when she gets home? Limited. And yet, in that same environment, 40 million people have a smartphone. 20 million of them will have watched videos over the last week, without doubt. 60% of adults, most of us, will look up health information online. So what do we do in the absence of, well, I'll give him a bit of paper or a letter. What we do is we go onto YouTube, we go onto Google, and hence the growth of Dr. Google. But Dr. Google and YouTube are unregulated, uncontrolled. 
You search sunbed juice when you go home, it will tell you the wonders of sunbed juice. Almost two-thirds of them will tell you, oh, wonderful stuff. But they won't mention melanoma. How can that be? How can we get advice of that nature? It's wrong. Our doctor is regulated, and we know what's good or bad from what we hear from the doctor, but do we know what's good or bad on YouTube? So in summary, people use smartphones. They get health information digitally. The pressure on the health system is growing as we sit here today. And somehow we need to reduce demand by helping people to better manage their own health, not rely on the system. But the health system is too reliant on letters and text. And bizarrely, John Lewis wouldn't understand this, many hospitals, if you travel around the country, don't have open Wi-Fi access for people to use when they are, should we say, in store. That's how John Lewis would look at it. Um, so we've got an NHS that's talking to a population who are living in 2008. The, the population aren't. They're in 2018 and beyond. So how do we put health knowledge where people live their lives? And that was the challenge that we were asking. So we were asking, how could we put knowledge into people's hands? How could we make sure that we were being successful in making that happen. And I can tell you, it was a struggle. And that struggle has taught us some really valuable lessons. And what I want to do is just look at what we've learned out of those lessons. But first, can I just look at an example? I'm going to get you to join in at this moment. It's not a big activity or anything, don't worry. Um, you haven't got to get up, dance or anything. If you've got a phone, and it's particularly if it's an Apple phone, can you just take your camera, open up the camera app, and zap that QR code? Some people in the back may not reach it. When you zap that code, there'll be a dialogue box that will pop up, hopefully, in the top box. What it will do is instantly take you to uh, a library of video, and what you will have instantly is health knowledge in your hands. That is your local hospital's library. 400 videos, uh, 450 videos, to help you care for, manage your condition, prepare for coming into hospital, prepare for your MRI, check your toes, use your inhalers, tell you what to do when you have a an attack through to your peanut allergy. Okay? Short, simple explainers that exist on YouTube. Enormous library, we've got over 1,200 of them, the biggest in the world, safer than Google. NHS clinicians have written these and they are good for you to use. And that's your local hospital. And every GP on this patch has that library available to them to help you. And it's not just nationally, it's in Liverpool. We've got people caring for their COPD and diabetes. In North Devon, we put little QR codes on people's plasters. So when they go home, they know how to ex uh, exercise their risks. In other words, we're putting knowledge where people live their lives. This is 2018, not 2008. But the health system struggles to recognise this. So Ken gets his letters, he gets his text-heavy web pages. He goes into hospitals that don't have Wi-Fi. And the challenge for entrepreneurs and innovators everywhere is how do you make that degree of change? How do you reach the whole of the UK? How do you reach the world when the biggest distributor you have just doesn't get it, doesn't understand what's possible, that actually we need to do stuff that fits with people's lives and how they live their lives? How do we make that happen? Now, some, some of you may say, well, Richard, you may say, try another channel. But the NHS is enormous. Over the next 36 hours, one million people will be handled and cared for and looked after brilliantly by the NHS. So we have to be there. But this isn't just about the NHS. This actually is about the fundamental challenge of getting your product to market. I don't care if it's hot dogs, taxis, accountancy services, it really, photo booths, it doesn't matter you somehow have to get it to market and distribute it. And sometimes when you try and bring it alive, your distribution channels, like ours, will prove tricky. Not impossible, because they're not impossible, but tricky. So how do you make them work? And this is what we have learnt. So these rules, I think, apply to every entrepreneur in the country, every innovator who's trying to bring something to market and struggling. Number one, think big whilst acting small. Think big. What is your aspiration? What is your real dream? What is your big picture? What are you trying to grasp? What, are you trying to, what change are you trying to make happen? Never, ever, please, let go of that aspiration. It's easy. People will beat you back. 
and it will be painful, but never lose that aspiration because it's that that drives you on, that that gets you up every morning, that that keeps you working, that that drives you on to make change happen and it will happen. But at the same time, you have to think small. You have to think about what we call small incisions, precise incisions into a system to find places where you can have impact and prove the value, both to yourself, because you need that as a reinforcement, but also to others so they get what you're about. And you must keep doing it and you keep pushing on, making those small incisions so you have impact and they grow and they coalesce and they get substance over time, but it takes time. Secondly, seek opportunity, but don't lose focus. Strategy is about creating options, possibilities for you and your business. So you must at all times look up and look out. Don't look at your shoes. There is a vast horizon of opportunity out there and your job is to go and look for that. So don't be wedded blindly to what you created initially. Look for more opportunities, new ways of doing things, but equally don't lose focus. If you spread your resources too thinly, you won't have impact. Tiny niches, those incisions, are where you can really have value and prove the worth of what you're doing. And maybe in those you'll find new ways, new distribution channels, new ways of operating. So don't lose sight of what you're trying to do, but focus in there. In the face of complexity, bring simplicity. The world is inherently complex. But users, you, us, me, every one of us, want simplicity in our lives, more so today than ever before. So you have a job to take complexity out of people's lives because it makes stuff more accessible. It makes it easier to make and grow and build your business, your idea into something that gets hold. So please, bring simplicity to everything you do. And lastly, inject energy where there is none, or sorry, where there is inertia. Inertia, as a good friend of mine will tell me regularly, is the strongest force in the universe. And he's right. Everyone says they're innovative and creative and flexible and responsive. They're not. Most people will carry on doing what they've always done and they'll always get what they always got. But we're, every one of us in room, about changing things and making things happen. So as an entrepreneur, you are a force of energy and a force of nature. Bring momentum where there is none. Find solutions, please, and make things happen. Deliver results. You can and you know you can because you know, every one of you, the impact you can bring onto the world. So please never lose sight of that belief because Ken and the rest of the world want you to bring your ideas and make them happen. So please go out there, whatever your business, whatever your innovation, and make it happen because you can. Thank you.